it's snowing outside today, it's very cold, and it's toasty in here. Now let's talk about how much it costs to run this system. All right, welcome back to A Little Mountain Life. My name is Don. I'm Natalie. And this is our one year update on our radiant heat system in our new pole barn house. It's been a year, huh? It's been a year. In fact, uh, we are filming this video on January 31st. I'm gonna publish it on February 1st. And we published last year's video on February 1st. No way. Yes way. Wow. I am that on top of things. <laughs> and our radiant heat has been up and running for a little and while. And we have been floored with the results. <laughs> so we've been heating our 1,000 square foot pool barn house with only radiant heat in the floors. Yep, that's it. We do have very tall ceilings. If you've been following along, you've seen us as we insulated this house and we put in the loft recently. It's very tall ceilings. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a normal 1,000 square foot house. There's a lot of space to heat yeah, here. Yeah, for sure. And I guess all along, I, I hoped that the whole concept of hot air rising would apply here mm -hmm. with, the, with the floors being heated. And, and I would say it is. Yeah, absolutely. It's plenty warm in here. I mean, it's snowing outside today. It's very cold and it's toasty in here. Yeah, I actually have the floors off right now because it's been so warm in the house. This slab has heated this house really, really well. And when we originally installed the system, it was a little over a year ago now, obviously, with last year's video being put out. And last year we didn't have the fiberglass put in yet. That's right, we just had the spray foam. And the soffits were still open, so we actually, it was drafty in here. Mm -hmm. You could feel like in, in these winter storms like what we're having right now, you would feel the cold air blowing into the house. Um, but the radiant heat was on and it kept us comfortable as we kind of had to move in here prematurely and didn't really have everything buttoned up like it should have been in a normal house. Now I'm about to talk about more technical stuff and the components. This is the disclaimer that I've had to make many times talking about this home build. I'm not an expert. I'm just a DIY dude just trying to get it done. And if it works, it works. It's not the prettiest setup. It's not the most efficient maybe, but it works well for us. So take everything in this video with a grain of salt. If you're looking to do your own radiant heat system, research it, use this video, and use other videos that you'll find on YouTube, and there's a lot of good ones out there to help you come up with your system that you need for your house. All right, so let's review uh, how we have our hydronic radiant heat system set up. It all starts back here with the electric tankless water heater, and the electric tankless water heater is not the way to go for a lot of people. A lot of people want to go with the propane or the full-on boiler setup. Those are, I guess, technically better setups, but we were kind of going for the easier for the DIY kind of setup and with anything with gas, propane, natural gas, that kind of stuff, you have to deal with ventilation and we're in a very tight space in a very small house. So this was the easiest way to go. At the time when we purchased our heaters from EcoSmart, they did advertise them as being able to be used with radiant heat systems. Now they're not saying that but it's been working great for us. We have no problems with our water heaters. The important thing with any water heater, but especially the electric ones, is that you maintain them. So you need to make sure that you're flushing them and making sure that they, they keep clean and efficient as you use them. Below your water heaters, you should have installed flush drain valves. And you'll see from our first video, we did not have those there because I did not know I needed those there. Uh, so that's something I later installed. We put those on the main 27 kW heater that we have for most of the house. And now we have them here so that you can flush out the system and make sure that there's nothing building up inside, especially inside of the heating elements. So then as you go through, we've got some shutoff valves. You've got your pressure gauge up here and we've got the air separator and your expansion tank here. And then we have another drain and fill a uh, set of valves here for draining and filling the whole system. You've got our one pump. This is another thing that was different from our first video. The first video, we had a pump over here and we had a pump here. Uh, didn't need two pumps in the system and I kind of just let one of them sit there inactive for the longest time. So now we just have the one circular pump here. This is the Grunfuss uh, circular pump. All the stuff on this wall 
in this manifold setup. I will put down in links down in the description, whether it's Amazon, everything else that's not from Amazon, we got from either Lowe's or supplyhouse.com. So you can check that out for yourself. So we've got the circulating pump, and then we get down into the manifold itself. And this is made by Bluefin. And you can see it actually takes up to six independent loops or zones. Um, but we are only using four of them because our house is not that big. So that's all we needed. So up here you have your little gauges. If you open these up, it opens up the whole system. And then down here with these knobs, you can increase or decrease the flow, uh, the, the gallons per minute that's going through each loop. So you can kind of fine tune your system and send more or less hot water to certain areas of the house. For us, again, with it being such a small house, I just have them all on the same setting because it's a small slab, small house. It might as well just all heat up or all cool down. If I wanted to, I could shut off an area, but we just, we haven't seen a need to be that specific with the system. So obviously here, this is where the hot water will come in and go down into the floor and go through all the different zones. And with those zones, you wanna make sure that your PEX is not running more than 300 feet. That's kind of like the recommendation from all the manufacturers with the radiant systems. Keep it under 300 feet and it should be good to go. Now with the PEX, it's something that you need to do obviously before the slab is poured. So way back in our old videos from a year ago plus, you can see how we went in and laid down the PEX, me and my buddy Nathan. We used zip ties to zip tie the PEX to the mesh that was gonna be inside of the concrete. And we were able to put in the loops and the different zones for different areas of the house. And the important thing with the PEX that you're putting down there is that it's rated for that application. For us, we use PEX type B and it's got the oxygen barrier. So we know that down below the slab, it is good to go. It's not gonna fail on us. There's no fittings or junctures in the slab when it comes to our radiant heat system. It goes down from here and comes up here and that's it. There's nothing down there. There's no elbows, there's no couplings. It's all good to go. It's rated for the application and we're just, we're not worried about it at all. So moving on, after the PEX comes up out of the floor, it comes over here into another pressure gauge and I've got temperature gauges here as well. So I can monitor the temperature going down into the slab and then monitor the temperature coming out of the slab to determine if I want to raise or lower that temperature at the water heater. So here we've got that uh, pressure gauge to monitor the pressure. And then this is called a Y strainer. And this will strain out any sediment or anything in the water. And with a system like this, ideally it's a closed loop system. So you don't have to worry about your well water or city water being an issue. Once you fill up the system and pressurize it, it's good to go, it runs on its own. And then obviously from there, it goes back up and continues the cycle. Another thing about our electric tankless water heater, it's EcoSmart 18. It's 18 kW and it has two separate elements, heating elements on the inside of it. And each one of those is 9 kW. So when I installed it, you have to run two large wires. I think they were eight gauge. I'll put it on the screen if I was right or wrong about that, but it should be eight gauge wire, I believe. And it goes all the way back to the circuit panel and each element gets its own uh, paired 40 amp breaker. And so we can actually control this from the breaker box as well, because with that breaker box, I can turn off one of the elements. If I'm not in a situation where it's crazy cold outside, but I do want the floors to be warm, I can actually run the floor with just one element from the heater. And that does fine. That's actually what we've been using. This whole week has been very, very cold outside, but once the temperature of the floor is up, we just need to maintain it at that point. And so I shut off the other element and that takes away 9kW of power that we were drawing initially. So now it's only drawing 9kW instead of 18. So that's another way to kind of save on your bill, save on your energy consumption. And we will talk about how much this system costs in just a second. Now over here is something I added after the fact. We have our thermostat here and with that there is a sensor that you wire into it and the sensor goes down to the floor over there and kind of pays attention to the ground temperature or the floor temperature inside the house and if it gets below a certain set point it'll kick on the whole system and it sends a signal to our controller box up here and then that will then send the signal to power on the radiant circulating pump right here. So let's talk about the cost of the system. 
in the original video, we did not have the controller and we did not have the thermostat with the sensor. So back then it was a little bit cheaper. I think it was just short of $1,500 for all of the components. When I ordered those parts to complete the system with the thermostat setup, that was another $175 that I spent at Supply House. So depending on where you can source your parts, Everything we did here, we did for $1,700 or just a little bit less than that. And I'll put all the stuff in the description below, again, with all the prices and where you can find the stuff, but that's how much we spent on our system. Again, this is not a huge house. This is 32 by 32. Four zones. Each zone of PEX is less than 275 feet total. I don't have the exact measurements on that, but I just bought a big roll of PEX for the whole house and used what I needed to for the floor. Another thing about the cost of the system, you have to factor in the insulation for the slab that you're on. I did not put the insulation of the slab into our cost because I know that some people insulate slabs anyhow. If you weren't going to insulate your slab, but now you are because of radiant heat, you'll have to add that into your cost evaluation. You know, it's a two inch foam board that you get from Lowe's or Home Depot. You have to put that all around your slab. So you have to kind of figure out how much that's gonna cost you as well, based on the square footage of your house. So everything you see here, including the pecs in the ground, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the cost of the system. I'm not talking about the cost of the slab itself. Now let's talk about how much it costs to run this system. Last winter, we did not have a good way of determining how much this whole system cost to run because the house was not insulated yet and it was not closed in, it, was, it wasn't real life. And now that we've been in the house longer and now that it's insulated and almost completely airtight now, we can have a better idea of how much it costs to actually run this system. So right now, after looking at our bills from the last few months and kind of looking at where things were last year, when the house was not insulated yet, we've determined that for a winter month, we spend on average between $200 and $250 a month on heating this house. So we are happy with this system and we are happy with how much it has cost us, not only to install it, but also to run it in the winter months. Our original video is the most popular video we have on our channel with 81,000 views as of the time of this filming. And so there's gonna be a lot of people out there with questions. Feel free to ask your questions down in the comments below. We're not experts, like I said, but we're happy to share our whole journey with building this house and doing all the different DIY stuff that we're doing. And hopefully some of the information we provide and stuff that we put out there uh, helps you guys make decisions if you're building your own house. So to round out our climate control in here, we're gonna be installing some multi-zone mini splits this summer. We haven't had air conditioning up here and it's gotten pretty hot in the summer. Yeah, a bit. So we're looking forward to having that this summer. And those can also be switched to heat, I guess, mm -hmm. for a backup. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we'll need them. It's been so warm in here, just with the floors. And the next year, we're also gonna put in a small wood-burning fireplace. Not because we need the heat, but- Wood-burning stove. Wood-burning stove, okay. Yeah. Not because we need the heat, but it'll be pretty, and also to have a backup heat source, since the floors are run off electricity. Yeah, I mean, we're going option. for the whole cabin vibe. Yeah. So. What's, what's a cabin without a wood-burning stove? Right. It'll be really nice crackling, to have that. Crackling fire. Yes. If this is your first time seeing our radiant heat system and you want to see how we put it in, check out our other video, our first video we yep. made a year ago. And thanks for checking out our little mountain life, and we'll see you all in the next one. Well, I hope you're